amen. Amen. Well, I'm sure you can do it better than I can by now. I've been messing up the last couple of times I'm doing it, so help me out here. The book of Acts is written by who, class? It was written by Luke. Very good. It's the same guy that wrote the Gospel of Luke, also wrote the book of Acts. And he is the only Gentile to write a book of the New Testament, the only doctor to write a book of the New Testament. And I'm so thankful that Dr. Luke the Gentile wrote this book of Acts. And the reason, well, remember, it is the bridge, right, between the New Testament Gospels, the stories of Jesus, and the New Testament epistles, the letters the early church fathers wrote to the first century church. And without that bridge, we'd be really lost because Jesus would be alive, he'd be about to resurrect back into heaven, and we're all excited that he's not dead, but then the next chapter in your Bible would, would be what? It would be 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and or Romans chapter 1, and you'd think, how did the church get to Corinth? What's that city? And what about Rome? And who are they? And how, who's this Paul guy? But we don't ask any of those questions. Why? Because we have the book of Acts. And also, the book of Acts is unique and important because it is the only book that that was one of the only books, not the only book, but one of the only books that has with it its own divine outline. That means I didn't outline it, neither did any pastor or Bible scholar. No, it was Jesus himself that outlined this book. And he outlines this book for us in chapter 1, verse 8, a verse you know well by now, where Jesus says, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you should be witnesses to me, what, in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts follows that outline exactly. The first seven chapters, the church is centered in the city of Jerusalem. Then in chapter 8, because of persecution under the leadership of Philip, the church moves out into Judea and Samaria, the central and southern parts of the nation of Israel. And then under the leadership of first Peter and then Paul, the church goes into the ends of the earth and the gospel is spread to the ends of the earth again, just like Jesus said it would. And we are well into that final section here tonight as we work our way chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the book of Acts. We are into that part where Paul has had now three missionary journeys taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he'll go on one more, but he won't really be a a missionary. He'll be more of a prisoner, but that won't stop Paul. He'll spread the gospel everywhere he goes. But how he becomes a prisoner on on his way to Rome, well, that's the story that is in front of us tonight. Paul, as we are here in chapter 22 in the the book of Acts tonight, Paul is in Jerusalem. He's come back because he wanted to attend the Feast of Pentecost. Jewish males were required as as, as often as they could uh, to come back to Jerusalem three times a year at Passover, at Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And Paul had, had missed those feasts for at least four years. And so he's trying to do what God wants him to do. He's coming back to Jerusalem, but it was more than just being here for a feast. He wanted to be in Jerusalem to reach the Jewish people. And we looked last week at what happened when he had that, that, that testimony there on the Temple Mount. Instead of mass revival and mass salvation, there was mass rioting. And the Romans, who were in Jerusalem at that time in force, because it was a feast time, the Jewish population would go from about 600,000 in the rest of the year to about 2 to 3 million at a feast as everyone came in for the feast. And that just gave rise to, to riots against Rome ruling their nation. And so the Romans would come in with lots of troops just to keep things quiet during that week-long celebration. And it's when these Roman soldiers stationed, you remember, in the Antonio Fortress, that fortress that looked out over the Temple Mount, as you can see in the slide in front of you. They're up in that, that building in the upper upper left-hand corner of that screen there. And they're looking down, and when they see a riot, this is you know Paul that's caused it, when they see the riot, they get down there, they pull Paul away from being beaten, and they put him in chains. And the Roman soldiers thought at first that Paul was this guy called the Egyptian. He was a man that had led a team of assassins into Jerusalem and they would just come in with their knives and they would, they would kind of get up close in the crowded streets and they would stab a Roman soldier or a Roman citizen and then they, or they would stab a, a, a member of the Jewish community. And either way, then they'd drop their knife and they'd disappear into the crowd. And, and though many of the assassins had been caught, their leader, this guy called the Egyptian, had not. And so the Roman soldiers, when they see 
how the crowds on the Temple Mount are reacting to Paul. They think, this guy's got to be that guy. He's responsible for so many deaths of, of Romans, who the Jews probably wouldn't care that much about, but of fellow Jewish citizens. So this has got to be the guy. But as they bring Paul into the Antonio Fortress, he starts speaking Greek to them, and they realize, this is no Egyptian. We've got the wrong guy. And Paul, classic Paul, he says, no problem, but can I address the multitude that just tried to kill me? And so the soldiers allow him to come out on the steps, and Paul gives his testimony, but of course, part of his testimony is that God has used him to reach the Gentiles for the kingdom of God. And to the average Jewish mind of the first century, even the Jews who believed that Jesus was their Messiah, boy, it was a tough concept for them to see Gentiles on, on co-equal footing as them, as Jews. And so when Paul used the word Gentile, they lost their minds again, and the Romans have to save Paul for a second time that afternoon. And they're planning on scourging Paul, the Romans are, because he'd been addressing the crowd in Hebrew, so they still don't know what's going on. The crowd doesn't know what's going on. And so they say, we're going to scourge you. We're going to open your back up. We're going to get a cat of nine tails and, and whip, bring pieces of flesh off of your back. And Paul says, hey, wait a second. I am a citizen of Rome. Because Paul knew it was illegal to beat and even imprison a Roman citizen without a trial. And so he knows they can't do this to him. And so he pulls out the fact, I am a Roman citizen. And these soldiers and this commander, who remember this commander we learned last week, was over a thousand troops. Ten different you know, garrisons would be part of, this, of this, uh, this gathering there on the Temple Mount. Ten centurions would work for him. This was one of the most important military leaders in Jerusalem, but he's afraid because he realizes his career and even his life is in jeopardy for imprisoning and almost beating a Roman citizen. So the commander knows I'm going to be asked why Paul, a Roman citizen, why I had him arrested. And to get to the bottom of what the reason was, he commands, this leader does, he commands the Jewish Sanhedrin to meet so they can sort things out. And that's where we pick it up tonight in verse 30 of Acts chapter 22. And we see the first thing tonight, and that is Paul confronting. He's confronting this group of, of the Sanhedrin. Who are they? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. Look at me if you would. Don't look at me. Look at the text. Looking at me, that's a terrible thing. Looking at the text, that's a good thing. Verse 30, Acts 22, it says, And the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, this is, this is the, the, the Roman leader that wants to know this, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priest and their council to appear and brought Paul down to set before them. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewash wall, <laughs> for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Do we know that today in our world? Anyways, let's move on. In order to figure out what's going on here, Paul and, is brought before the Jewish Sanhedrin. The Roman, Roman army thinks if we get him before the Jewish leaders, I can get a better picture of what's going on so I know why he was brought into my custody. So he's letting, he's letting the Sanhedrin uh, figure out what's wrong with Paul. Now, so we all understand the Sanhedrin comes from a Greek word that translated into English as the council. It, what they were was a, the religious ruling body in the nation of Israel in the first century. Their word was final on matters of Jewish law, dealing with Jewish customs and Jewish religious things, things that Rome didn't want to get involved with. And you should know as a Bible student that the, the Jewish Sanhedrin was made up of three groups, three different types of people sat on this council. 
Number one was the high priest, both the current and any that were still alive as they would often serve for a number of years. So any of the high priest, current and former, and those that were of the, the priestly line, they would also be there. And then secondly, there were the elders. And the elders were the leaders of the people, the priestly aristocracy. And most of them at the time that this is written here, the book of Acts, most of them were Sadducees. And then there were the scribes, the experts on the law of God. And they were most Pharisees at this time. So Paul is brought before this group that's made up of priests, it's made up of elders, it's made up of scribes, all religious and biblical experts. And Paul is brought before this group, and I love it. He stares them down. He looks earnestly, uh, chapter 23 starts out. He's just staring them down, and then he has the audacity to call them brothers. Now, this was not normal. This was not the normal greeting of how a Jewish citizen or a Roman citizen, for that matter, would address the Sanhedrin. Normally, they had the privilege of be calling, being, being called fathers, or they would simply be called the council. But Paul calls them brothers because, remember, at one time, he was one of them. At one time, he would, would have been one of the scribes, one of the, the Pharisees that were part of the Sanhedrin. He knew these men. He knew the word as well as they did and most likely most better, much better than most of them. This was his old circle of friends. And so Paul calls them brothers. So at first they're not happy by this casual greeting and then even more so at his assertion that he had a clear conscience before God. Paul is saying is my conscience is clear because it's God that called me to the Gentiles and to Christ. I am not in the wrong here. I am doing what God has told me to do. And of course, his statement then put the Sanhedrin at odds with God. Because if Paul was right and had a clear conscience before God, then the Sanhedrin would not be. And again, that was nothing that they wanted to hear. And so therefore, the high priest orders Paul to be just smacked across the face. Now, this high priest, whose name is Ananias, has one of the most detailed reigns of any high priest because he was so corrupt and wicked and because of the timing historically of his reign, lining up with many, many Bible stories. And according to Josephus, he stole tithe money. It wasn't just Christians that invented tithing. The Jews would take 10% of their income and they would give it to the priestly ministry of the temple to, in order to support the priest and support the work of the ministry. The same, the same reason maybe that, uh, that you decide. So I'm going to give a portion of my income to the church that I'm a part of. Well, well, what Ananias would do is he would steal those tithes. Well, I thought they were his in the first place. Don't listen to me. He would steal the tithes that were supposed to go to support the other priest, his assistant pastors, if you would, of the day. He he would keep it all for himself and he would threaten if anyone had a problem with that, well, then he would put them to death. <laughs> what a great pastoral heart this guy had. I want all of you working for me, but I'm not paying you a dime. In fact, I'm keeping your wages. In his history, he ordered the murder of thousands of Samaritans, these half Jew, half Assyrians who lived just north of Jerusalem. He was a wicked man. In fact, it, part of in his reign, he was called to appear before Caesar in Rome. And you know, if, if Caesar's getting involved, you've done some terrible things if he wants to question why you're doing what you're doing. And, and history tells us he just paid him off. He just took that same tithe money that hardworking Jewish people had given to the Lord, and he took it right up and put it in Caesar's pocket. And because of that, he was acquitted. And yet, like it almost always is true, it's not going to end well from, for Ananias. The Jews will rebel against Rome in 68 AD, a couple of years before the Romans come down and put down that rebellion and destroy the city. But two years before in 60 AD, the Jewish people storm Ananias' quarters and they kill this wicked man. And that is just about 14 years away from the story we're reading in the text today. So his time is coming. But in Acts chapter 23, he's very much alive and he orders Paul to be hit. Now it's clear that Paul has had enough with being beaten for one day. This, this, this is like his fourth beating of the same day. And so he lashes out, verse 3. It was outrageous to Paul that it was against the law to beat an uncondemned man, and yet these men were judging whether Paul had broke the law, and then they just broke the law. And so Paul calls them whitewashed tombs. <laughs> 
Now, Jesus used that phrase in speaking of the Pharisees. Paul is now using that phrase. It's probably important as Bible students, we understand what that phrase means. In in Judaism, you could be defiled and therefore not be able to appear before God and offer your sacrifices if you accidentally walked over or touched an unmarked grave. So what the Jews would do, especially in these feast times when the city was just wall-to-wall people, is they would freshly paint their tombs bright white. So you could see them from anywhere and you could know, oh, that's a tomb. I'm not going to get anywhere close to it, so I won't be defiled. And these tombs, they looked great on the outside, all freshly painted. But the truth was, inside, someone was still dead and decaying. And Paul says, that's you guys, your whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside with your little robes and your headdresses, but inside you are dead and decaying. However, though, when Paul was pointed out the fact that this was a high priest he rebuked, Paul says, I didn't know. Why did Paul not know who the high priest was? This guy had been in power for a long time. Well, some scholars say This was because this was an informal meeting called by the Roman army so they didn't have time to put on their little fancy robes and Ananias didn't get his little high priest hat on. Others suggest that this was further sarcasm from Paul. Like he was saying, oh, I didn't know that was you. You're certainly not acting like a high priest. But personally, I don't think it was either of those things. For Paul seems genuinely repentive, even quoting Exodus 22, uh, verse 8, in, or verse, Exodus 22, 28, there in verse 5, when he says that he, just, he didn't understand who he was and, and that he needed to show uh, respect for this position of authority, even if the man was corrupt. So I don't think Paul was being sarcastic, nor do I think they didn't have on their robes, because no one historically we know about these guys, they never missed a chance to put their fancy robes on. So this would have been the, the Roman leaders calling us, we're going to put our fancy robes on. So I don't think it was either of those things. I think Paul didn't know who it was, because Galatians chapter 6 and other places seem to indicate that Paul, as he got older, had a more serious and more serious and more serious, the older he got, an eye condition. Writing in uh, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul says this. He says, For I, I, I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them given him to me. He says to the Galatian people. Me, me, people think the reason they would have given him their eyes is Paul had an eye condition. Maybe from con- contracting typhoid fever on his first missionary journey. Maybe from all the beatings he endured. Maybe some believe he had the early stages of cataracts, which they didn't know how to properly treat in the first century and so that means he would have had like uh, frequent eye infections and often substance oozing from his eyes but the people in Galatia loved Paul and said they'd given him his own eyes but just points again to this fact he had poor vision and again that was even more so the older that he got the more beatings he endured you know outside of the Bible the early first century writings describe Paul the apostle as not much to look at they describe him as short They describe him as balding, which I think those two things make him a very good looking guy. So anyway, short and balding. But then they say he has a has a big nose and stuff was dripping out of his eye. So Paul wasn't gracing the cover of GQ. And when it came specifically to his eyes, it made it difficult to see and difficult to write. He'd often write with big letters, he says, when he would sign the the epistles with his own name. And then he used a scribe to write most of the stuff he did. So he he had a serious eye condition and no medical way to get rid of it. And so I think that's what's going on. He just can't see. So he's, somebody yells out, hit that guy. And he's like, you're a wash, wash tomb. And hey, that's the high priest. And he's like, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm not supposed to speak evil of a ruler of the people. But Paul knows that in doing that, though, he's now in trouble. He's now in trouble. And let's see what I mean by that. Looking at verse six. But Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees. And he cried out to the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, for the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. 
Then there arose a loud cry, and the scribes of the Pharisee party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified to me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. After insulting the high priest, no matter how well deserved, Paul's now in trouble. Because remember, we've mentioned a few times in the last couple of weeks that though history history records that the Romans had taken away the right of capital punishment to the Jews. That happened uh, about around around 10 or 12 uh, AD. The reality is, is they still allowed the Jews to kill people in their sacred assemblies. So in the temple, they could put someone to death. If you wandered in there as a, as a Gentile or as a woman, they could kill you right on the spot. And in the places where their Sanhedrin met. And that's where Paul's sitting right at this moment. So he could be put to death, especially if the charge was religious, like defiling the temple, which is, remember what they had accused him of. And so Paul hadn't defiled the temple, but again, how does he know this kangaroo court is going to see things fairly and give a fair report? So Paul tries something different with this group. With the Romans, he pulls the citizenship card. He says, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't arrest me or beat me without a trial. But he knows that isn't going to fly with the Sanhedrin. They don't care who you're a citizen of. So Paul tries something very different. He tries good old political distraction. He cries out, it's because of the resurrection. The the reason I'm being accused is I believe in resurrection and these, these guys don't and that's why they're accusing me today. Now, of course, this wasn't the issue at all. But Paul bringing this up, it's a, it's a brilliant political move. And understand why, again, we need a little insight on the background of this group we're learning about tonight called the Sanhedrin. We, we talked about what their makeup was. They had, they had priests, high priests, former and current. They had, they, had, uh, you know, this, they had the elders who were primarily Sadducees. And then they had the scribes who were primarily Pharisees. But, but beyond the groups, there were two political rival that were in the Sanhedrin, two political points of view, kind of like at our Congress, made up of Democrats and Republicans. So the Sanhedrin was made up of two vastly different political and religious groups. One were the ones that Paul was once a part of, the Pharisees. It's the most famous religious, Jewish religious group in the Bible because we know them because of their frequent interactions with Jesus in the New Testament. Paul was once a Pharisee. His father was a Pharisee. And their numbers in the first century were about 6,000. And their influence was huge. The Pharisees came into power and prominence during the reign of the Maccabees, which puts it about 200 years before Christ came to earth. They originally formed, it's important that you know this, they originally formed in order to protect the nation from idolatry. You see, these men that originally formed the Pharisees, they they realized the reason our forefathers were taken into captivity first in Assyria and then in Babylon was because they were idolaters. They broke the law of God. So what they did is they drew circles around the word of God. In other words, this is what God's word says, but we're not going to even do this. We're not going to even come this close to breaking the word of God. And, And their hearts originally were awesome. I mean, that sounds like a great heart, right? I want to do whatever I can to not violate God's will. That sounds great. Here's the problem. Over time, their man-made boundaries to God's law became more important than God's law itself. So whereas God says you need to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, they would say you can't put in your false teeth on the Sabbath. <laughs> and again, we, we, we could laugh and talk for all night long about all the, the weird, strange rules that the Jews had come up with by the first century. But, but the point is this, those boundaries originally with a great intent that they never break the law of God, they became more important than the law of God itself. And so they get a bad rap because of that in the New Testament, rightfully so. But what we need to know as Bible students is some of them really loved God. Some of them really had a relationship with God. Now, they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, not the vast majority of them. Paul certainly did. Nicodemus did. All all these guys. But but most of them didn't. Uh, 
But what they believed theologically about God was really solid. They believed in angels. They believed that angels and demons were real things. They believed in the sovereignty of God. They believed in the inspiration of all of the word of God, that all of God's word is true. They believed in the importance of prayer. They believed in faith and good works together. And and of course, as already stated here in the text, they believed that once you died, if you knew the Lord, you would be resurrected in heaven with God. So if you hear what I'm saying, the Pharisees believed most of what you believe as a conservative Christian. I know the main difference, you believe Jesus was the Messiah, and most of them didn't, but, 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 but except for that issue, and that's a big except, uh, obviously, but, but they believe just like you. They believe this is the inspired word of God. They believed they'd be resurrected up in heaven someday. They believed that everything God said was true. In fact, Jesus believed very much like a Pharisee. He told his own disciples in the Gospel of Matthew, he said, therefore, whatever they, speaking of the Pharisees, Whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But then he said, but don't do according to their works, for they say and they do not do. <laughs> Jesus says, what they say, do it, because it's good stuff. What they do, eh, don't, don't follow that. But what they actually say, you should keep it, because they had the same belief structure that Jesus, that, that God had. So these, these Pharisees were one part of, of the Sanhedrin. The other part was made up of Sadducees. And their history is a little less well-preserved because in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem and its entire religious structure that was operating at that time. And because the Sadducees were in charge, almost all of them were massacred because Rome held them responsible for the rebellions happening on in Rome. So from 70 AD to this day, Normal Judaism is more of a Pharisaical. I don't, I don't mean that in the way we use it today, like Pharisee meaning hypocrite. I mean, they believe like Pharisees. The Judaism of the, the second century, the third century, it was very much Pharisee Judaism because they survived and the Pharisees, or the Sadducees, sorry, did not. Now, what do we know about the, the Sadducees? They, they started around the same time as the Pharisees, around 200 BC. Their belief structure, though, was almost the exact opposite of the Pharisees. They didn't believe that angels were real things. They didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe there was a heaven. They didn't believe miracles. They didn't believe most of the Bible as being the word of God. And I'm trying really hard to then not add the old joke, that was why they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in all this cool stuff. They were liberal theologians of their day. They believed in God, but nothing the Bible said about him. And because of this belief structure, they continued to lose numbers until Rome and Herod came to power in the region. When, when Rome and Herod were evaluating who to entrust with the, the power of the, of, the, of the Jewish religious temple, they gave it to the Sadducees, and the reason is they thought they were easier to control. The Pharisees were religious and were conservative, and they weren't going to listen to anybody, so they're really hard to control. But these Sadducees, they, they're a lot, lot more you know, liberal in their views, and they're not really dug into what the Bible says is true, so, so they'll follow what we do. And so they entrusted, the government entrusted the Sadducees with the control of the priesthood at that time and the vast majority of the Sanhedrin as well. So Paul, knowing all of this, knowing he's sitting in a group made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, the Pharisees being the conservatives of the day, the Sadducees being the liberals of the day, he yells out, the reason they dragged me in here is because I believe that we're going to resurrect from the dead. (laughs) It would be the equivalent today of being dragged into Congress, which obviously has Democrats and Republicans and saying, the reason I'm here is because I'm pro-life. You would just know, man, half of the room is going to agree with you and the other half is going to be against you. And it totally worked for Paul. If you look at verse 9, look at what they start saying. Well, maybe God did speak to him. Who knows? Are you kidding me? I guess politics is thicker than religion because instead of uniting under their hatred of Jesus in Paul's life as they had united in their hatred of Jesus himself, instead they say, Maybe he has heard from the Lord. Who can say? Who knows? Oy vey. But then another riot breaks out in the Sanhedrin. And the Romans have to go in and get Paul out before these religious guys rip him to, to, rip him to shreds. And then the Lord steps in and we'll 
get back to verse 11 in just a minute, but I want you to see what happens starting in verse 12 as we see the Jews beginning to plot against him. Verse 12, it says, And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now, there was more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. And then they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath that we would eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. The Roman guards pull Paul out of the Sanhedrin, save him again. They bring him back to the barracks. But this conspiracy breaks out to kill Paul. The Sadducees, who are again were the majority of the Sanhedrin, they realize they're not going to get the Pharisees on board to order Paul's death. So they need another method. And about 40 of them take a vow that they're not going to eat a bit of food until they kill Paul. And the emphasis of the Greek text is serious. The language says that they invoke divine judgment on themselves if they fail to carry out their oath, which is pretty heavy considering Paul will go on to live for about six to eight more years after this oath is made. That is some hungry Sadducees. In fact, I think that's why they were Sad you. See, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got to use it in a different context. I love it. But it looks like it'll be curtains for Paul now that this plot is formed and 40 men have taken this super serious oath to fulfill their vow. How will Paul get out of this? Well, after seeing Paul confronting and politicking and the Jews plotting, now we see God protecting. Look at verse 16. It says, So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went into the barracks and told Paul. And Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one the things that you have revealed to me. So he called for two centurions, saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night. That's nine o'clock at night. And provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote this letter, wrote a letter in the following manner, Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them, coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council, and I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told to me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And the next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. And when they came to Caesarea, they had delivered the letter to the governor and they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what providence he was from. And when he understood that he was from Sicilia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's Praetorium. Wow. Paul is doomed except for the hand of the Lord. And that's a huge except, isn't it? God, God is not intimidated by this plot against the Apostle Paul. He just so happens to put Paul's nephew in earshot of the conspirators. Now, that's awesome, but it also raises a question. What was Paul's nephew doing in Jerusalem 
since we know from many extra-biblical sources that Paul's family was in Tarshish. Well, it could be that he was just following his uncle Paul in his footsteps, that he was from Tarshish, but now that he was 12, 13 years old, he was in Jerusalem to become a Pharisee, just like his uncle and, uh, and Paul's dad as well. It could be, it could be, but if that's the case, then why did he care what happened to his disgraced uncle? Did he still have a soft spot for his uncle? Did he agree with the Pharisees that no matter how much they disagreed with Paul, he was not deserving of death? Maybe, or maybe Paul's sister was saved and part of the church in Jerusalem. We really don't know. All we know is God is so good when these 40 guys are like, we got the unbreakable plan. There's this little boy hanging out and he happens to be Saul's nephew. God is in control. Do you realize that church? As you go through things, you think, I just don't know how this is going to work out. Boy, if it's up to you, you should be worried. If it's up to me, you should be really worried. But if it's up to the Lord, and it is, wow, we're going to be okay. God is going to see us through because he has things in place. He has places and people in positions we don't even know about yet. And at the right time, when it makes sense, God is going to come through for you and he's going to come through for me because that is the God that we serve. I just love this. Paul puts, God puts Paul's nephew right where he needs to be. And he takes this plot to his uncle Paul who tells him to go to the commander and then he orders Paul, the commander does, to be taken at night to Caesarea. Caesarea is 65 miles north of Jerusalem on the coast where Jerusalem is pretty central in the middle of the nation. And so the commander tells the troops to leave at 9 p.m. so that no conspiracy will break out. And he wrote a letter that was required to send to someone who is your superior. Next week, we're going to meet Felix. We'll start to talk about him and his wife, Drusilla, on Sunday morning. I'm really excited about the study we're going to have this Sunday morning. But this whole next week, we'll be in Luke chapter, sorry, Acts chapter 24, and we will learn about this governor, Felix. But he is this Roman military leader in Jerusalem, his superior. Felix is the governor of Israel at this time appointed by Rome. And so he's got to write him a letter saying, here's why I'm sending this prisoner to you. And I just love this letter. A riot broke out and I saved this man because I knew he was a Roman citizen. (laughs) That's that's, that's not exactly what happened. Oh, then when it appeared that Sanhedrin was going to tear him apart, I learned of the plot and I saved him because he is a Roman. Did I mention he is a Roman? (laughs) It sounds like this guy is nervous that it's going to get out to his superior that he imprisoned without an uncondemned Roman. And so he just wants to paint himself in the best light in this letter. And I don't know, knowing what we know about Felix, I don't, I don't blame him a bit. And so they take Paul at night and he travel first to Antipatris. Antipatris was a Roman fort about halfway between Jerusalem and Caesarea. And it was put there for this exact purpose, not to take care of Paul, but oftentimes, as you remember, the, the, the Roman governor would live in Caesarea. That's where Felix is as the feast is now over there in Jerusalem. So he's in his seaside resort in Caesarea. But when he would travel Jerusalem three times a year, he wouldn't go 65 miles in one day. That's easy for you and I in our cars. That would be super hard on horseback. So they had a stopover. And there at Antipatris, they had a Roman fort, well guarded, well protected, where, where Romans could go when they're traveling from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Well, this is going the opposite way, and they're taking Paul. And so they get him as far as the fort. They rest their night that night there, and then the next day, they take him on to the city of Caesarea, where Paul will be safe. And then he's going to have this great defense, first in front of Felix and Drusilla, and then he'll be replaced by Festus and this lady Bernice, and we'll, we'll meet them over the next couple of weeks. But before we go our way tonight, I want to draw your attention back to verse 11. Paul has got to be a little despairing here in this moment. We know he was despairing because Jesus shows up to him in verse 11 there of, of chapter 24 and says, or sorry, chapter, chapter 23, and says, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified to me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness to me of Rome. If, if God shows up in your room and says, Hey, don't be so sad. Be of good cheer. What does that let you know? You're probably a little sad. 
And, and why, why would Paul be discouraged? Why would he be discouraged while he sat there in the, in the barracks? Well, as I made the case for last Wednesday night, if you missed it, I encourage you to listen to it online because it'll make a lot more sense of what I'm about to say. But I made the case for it last week that Paul had such a heart to reach the Jewish people. And yet it was just one failure after another after another. And I wonder if it was finally hitting Paul's heart that that would never happen in his life. He would never be the catalyst for a great Jewish revival among his people. And even more than that, even more than the fact that he wanted to reach the Jews and that wasn't happening, he knew he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. God had done that, God had much, much fruit with him, and yet, and now he realizes, boy, because I keep pushing to reach the Jewish people, now I find myself in prison and will I ever be able to go reach the people God has called me to reach, the Gentiles. I'm sure that's what Paul was wondering. Will I ever get a chance to do it again? Or am I going to spend the rest of my life in jail. Has he moved me to Caesarea just to delay the Jews from getting their hands on me because Paul knew the Roman, the Roman officials would trade his life for peace in a millisecond. And so I wonder if he was thinking, have my choices, has my choice to insist on doing things my way and share with the Jews, have my choices hindered what God wanted to do in my life? Now, of course, that's just speculation on my part. Because the text doesn't tell us what Paul was feeling. But I'm pretty sure if Jesus goes up and tells you to not be discouraged, I am pretty sure that's a good indicator of what? That you are discouraged in that moment. And, and, and it's just speculation, but I think it's good speculation. But here's what I do know. You and I will face that on a regular basis. Times where we just sit alone and think, Lord, how dumb have I been? You've been so good to me, and yet I have insisted on doing things my own way, pushing against you, pushing against your will. And Lord, now maybe I've just pushed my way out of some good things that you wanted to do in my life. Am I the only one that's ever had moments like that? If I am, it's okay. I can preach to myself. I'm basically alone in the sanctuary anyways. So I can preach to myself. Sorry, precious team that's also here. I know you guys are here. But moving on, maybe you feel that way tonight. Well, for us, especially when you're in the place of discouragement, discourage at yourself and your choices, you need to listen up. Because Jesus comes to Paul, who's feeling that way, and instead of condemning him, instead of saying, how dare you? You keep pushing this reaching the Jew thing, and look, you found yourself in prison once again. That's what I often expect to hear from the Lord. Because I know what I'm supposed to be doing for Jesus. And I think, oh, but I'm going to try this. Oh, I like this idea. And, and I mess up, and I think, how dumb can I be? And I just expect the Lord going, pretty dumb. <laughs> you are a loser. That's what I expect to hear. But what do we read in verse 11? We read that Jesus comes to the Apostle Paul and says, be of good cheer. It's a phrase that's translated other places in the Bible, be encouraged, same Greek phrase. Be of good cheer, be encouraged, take heart. And do you realize that it's only Jesus that uses this phrase in the New Testament. He uses it multiple times. That's why you're so familiar with it. The first time is in Matthew 9, 2. When four friends, if you want to put that verse on the screen, when four friends brought a man who was paralyzed to Jesus. But more than his physical infirmity, this man was in bondage to sin. And Jesus looked in his eyes. And instead of saying, look at what your sin has done to your body. That's not what Jesus says. What does he say there right there in the text? He says, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Your sins are gone. Your sins are gone. The second time Jesus used that phrase is in Matthew 9, 22, later in the same chapter. This time he's ministering to a woman who has an issue of blood. And in Jewish culture, this means that she was not allowed to participate in worship. She couldn't go to church. I know it was called synagogue, but we call it church. You know what I mean? She couldn't, she couldn't go to go hang out with the Lord and spend time with him and his people. She was in a place of isolation because of her condition. And Jesus comes to her and doesn't say, you stained woman. 
You, you woman with an issue, what's wrong with you? Ew, why can't you stop? That's not what he says. He says to her, just like he said to his disciples, he said, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Your faith has healed you. The third time is in Matthew 14, 27, when Jesus said those words to his disciples when they were going across the Sea of Galilee. He sent them across and he said, you go across the sea, I'll come and meet you later. And yet that night, you remember, a great wind came upon and the waves were rocking that little boat and they were afraid. And Jesus comes out to them walking on the water. And instead of saying, you bunch of wimps, what's, what's wrong with you? I told you you were going to go over to the other side, not under the water. Why are you worried? Trust me. That's not what he says. He says to them, take courage, take courage, be encouraged, be of good cheer. I am with you. And the final time he used that phrase in the Gospels, he'll use it again in Acts, we just saw it. But in the Gospels was the last night he was with his disciples. John 16, he told them the difficult news that he was leaving them. And dark days were coming for them. But instead of saying, but then we get to go to heaven, so stop your complaining. I had to be crucified. What's your problem? That, that's not what he said. He pulls him aside and says, take courage. I've overcome the world. Take courage. And what I love about this, friends, as we close tonight, is no matter where you are, friend, some of you are discouraged because you feel like you failed. Your sins have cost you, crippled you, like that man that they brought to Jesus that his four friends brought. And the enemy would have you think God's heart for you would be say, I told you, I told you sin would work out this way in your life. What a loser. Maybe instead, what Jesus would say to you, take courage, be encouraged. My blood has washed away all of your sins. That's the truth. Yes, there are consequences to the things we do that are wrong, but it's not the end of your story because our God is strong and he's forgiven our sins. Maybe you feel like that woman with the issue of blood. You just feel isolated. Maybe especially now in this time of COVID-19, you, you feel isolated. You feel like you're, you're, you're at outs with God. Maybe you feel dirty because of choices you've made or maybe other things that have happened to you. As, as happened in the case of her. What do you need to hear tonight? What you need to hear is that God doesn't see you as stained. He doesn't see you as dirty. He would say to you, take courage. Be encouraged. Your faith has healed you. You believe in me. You've trusted in me to take away your sins. I have removed the stains that you have done. I've removed the stains done against you. Take courage, precious one. Maybe like the disciples, God has called you to something and yet you didn't know it was going to be this hard. You know what God has called you to do, but this is a lot harder than you thought it would be. And the wind and the waves and the trouble, and really there's no way out. And you're afraid, you're discouraged. Oh, hear me, church family. God doesn't look at you and say, what's your problem? I told you life's tough. <laughs> Buck up. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what he says. He doesn't say, why can't you endure it like I endured suffering? That's not what he says. He says, take courage. Be encouraged. I am with you. You don't have to fear. You don't have to be afraid. Even though it looks bad, you don't have to be afraid because I am with you. Or maybe like the disciples, you're overcome with heartache. Bad news. A bad report from the doctor a bad report from the boss. And you, you tune into church and you hear the songs and the, the lessons. And, but like the disciples that last night, you just can't get, you can't get the bad report out of your mind. Well, to you, God would say, not be thankful. You're going to heaven someday. What's wrong with you? <laughs> That's not it. He'd lovingly say to you tonight, take courage. Be encouraged. I am have overcome this world and everything in it. To Paul the apostle who was down and hurting alone, Jesus spoke right into his heart, take courage, there will be a tomorrow. Oh, there was a three-year three season where Paul dealt with the choices he made. But God wasn't done with Paul. 
God was going to send him to Rome and he would write some of the most important books in the New Testament. And some of the most important people in the New Testament would get saved in that time. God was not done with Paul. And hear me, precious church, God is not done with you. God is not done with you. You continue to cling to him. You continue to trust him through the discouragement. God wants to lift your eyes tonight above your sin and its consequences, above the isolation you feel, the depression you feel, the, the circumstances out of control. God wants to lift your eyes above all of that tonight and say to you, be encouraged. That phrase can only be properly said by him because it's only him that has paid the price for you to be forgiven. It is only His presence that will see you through. It's only Him that has overcome the world. So take courage. There will be a tomorrow. God has more for you. Take courage, precious church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.